And uh, um, as was already uh, announced, uh, the topic is absolute and relative space in uh, classical uh, dynamics. And uh, I will start with uh, uh, Newtonian and Leibnizian space-time and dynamics, then Du Châtelet's and Kant's concepts of uh, space and time, and uh, finally space and time in classical and uh, modern uh, physics. Now let's start with uh, Newtonian uh, and Leibnizian space uh, and time. And here in the beginning there is of course uh, uh, Newton's uh, Principia and uh, according to that material bodies moved in a absolutely uh, stationary space do, uh, we'll do it in this way, um, absolutely stationary space due to their inertia and uh, gravity according to the axiom of uh, mechanics and he distinguishes relative and uh, absolute time of uh, absolute um, of absolute space. Now, uh, what is the uh, structure of this concept of uh, space and time? In absolute uh, space, with absolute time, it is decidable for uh, two events whether they occur absolutely simultaneously or not, and therefore uh, time axis here can be represented by a vertical axis and the three-dimensional space of simultaneously events um, with uh, respect to the restriction of our human intuition is uh, represented here by um, these uh, uh, planes um, along the uh, time axis and the layers represent the respective present separating uh, the past and uh, the future. And uh, in the diagram, uh, absolute rest is uh, represented by this vertical line representing the ab absolute space because there is no change in time and um, uniform uh, motion by uh, sloping straight lines here and acceleration by uh, curves. Now uh, the great competitor of uh, Newton are Leibniz. For Leibniz, space is a system of geometrical relations between uh, bodies that has no ontological existence, a pure mathematical view, and in contrast to Newton, he uh, emphasizes the relativity of all points and time since they cannot be absolutely uh, distinguished uh, according to his uh, famous uh, principle of uh, sufficient uh, reason. Now, what is the structure of this uh, uh, concept of space and time? Like Newton, Leibniz assumes that it is objectivity, or that it is uh, objectively decidable uh, for two events, whether they are simultaneously uh, uh, occurring or not, and uh, therefore the layers here are again. Um, uh, ordered along uh, the time axis, but in this diagram there is no representation of uh, the uh, absolute uh, space uh, and uh, Leibniz only states a kinematic uh, principle of relativity in uh, mechanics and therefore he cannot explain dynamic effects such as the occurrence of centrifugal forces in uh, circular uh, motion. And that was uh, crucial for Newton. Uh, Newton needs the absolutely stationary uh, space as reference system uh, for inertial movements, his uh, Lex uh, Inertiae, and he illustrated that in an uh, experiment. A bucket, for example, with water is uh, twisted here on, uh, on the left, hanging uh, from a sail, and when you let go uh, the bucket, then it rotates and pulls the water with it here on the right. And also the rotating bucket and the rotating water are at rest relative to each other. And that is the point of uh, Leibniz, uh, the water uh, deforms. Why? Uh, Newton attributes this effect to absolute rest and uh, empty uh, space. And uh, that was, of course, 
uh, criticized by Leibniz and uh, by uh, Berkeley, and uh, later on in the end of the 19th century by uh, Ernst Mach, because they criticize the absolute space as a metaphysical fiction, because it cannot be observed. And that was against Newton's own principle of research, research uh, hypothesis non uh, fingo. How can emptiness cause an observable effect? And uh, that uh, leads to a famous thought experiment of Ernst Mach. How does the water surface, he argued, change when the rotating bucket wall becomes thicker and uh, more massive here with these uh, several leaks? And uh, in the end, that leads to uh, the so-called uh, Mach's uh, principle, namely inertial effects are caused, he argued, by relative movements of stellar masses. And this idea even at least inspired uh, Einstein uh, later on. Now, uh, it is obvious space and time cannot be considered separated from uh, dynamics and therefore in the next part, Newtonian and Leibnizian uh, dynamics. And now back to, um, uh, to Newton and uh, his uh, Principia. And uh, you know, this book is written in a purely synthetic uh, style. It seems to be, it is a continuation of Euclid's uh, elements in an axiomatic way now, uh, starting uh, as a synthetic uh, theory with uh, basic uh, definitions of basic uh, concept like space and time, and then axioms. Axioms which are following uh, Newton are distinguished by empirical evidence, starting with the law of inertia, lex inertia, concerning force-free movements on a straight line or at rest, and then uh, the second law um, uh, claiming that uh, every uh, effect, every change of a situation has a force as, uh, as cause. And uh, the third law of in, uh, interaction, actio, is equal to reactio. And actually, uh, the second uh, law is not a law, but it is a scheme of laws, because uh, F is here unspecified, and a famous uh, example of uh, uh, Newton was gravitation. And uh, then uh, the physics of uh, Earth in the Galilean tradition, fall and, th and throw um, uh, law, and uh, uh, the physics of heaven, Kepler's planetary laws, and so on, can be mathematically derived as model from the axioms of dynamics and uh, gravitation law. And uh, you know, in the generation before uh, Newton, uh, there started a paradigm shift in mathematics, in uh, geometry, from synthetic, traditional uh, geometry to analytical. Uh, geometry, and uh, that was, of course, Descartes. He established um, analytical geometry in which points, straight lines, curves uh, of Euclid, synthetic geometry, are defined by numbers and the functions and equations. I will not go here in the details. That is a uh, well known um, school uh, math nowadays. The point is that the laws of algebra take the place of the geometric view. And now, on this basis, of uh, analytical geometry, the uh, first steps in the direction of analytical um, uh, uh, mechanics um, uh, were made uh, possible. Um, fundamental concepts of dynamics, such as uh, velocity, acceleration, and force, could mathematically uh, be uh, defined by infinitesimal terms of Leibniz uh, um, uh, famous uh, calculus. For example, on the basis of Leibniz calculus, in the time of uh, Leibniz, Varillon uh, defined the concept of simultaneous instantaneous velocity as a differential uh, quotient. Um, for uh, the velocity, for the duration of an instant uh, dt, during which the infinitesimal small pass dx is uh, traversed. And in modern terms, that is uh, the first uh, derivation, the first derivative of the pass uh, according to uh, time. And the instantaneous uh, acceleration, uh, in the same way, 
uh, was uh, explained in modern terms as a second derivative uh, of uh, uh, the path. And you know uh, the instantaneous acceleration, according to Newton's second law of mechanics, corresponds to the instantaneous accelerating uh, force. And uh, on uh, uh, that background, these infinitesimal terms now can nicely be illustrated by our geometric uh, in uh, intuition. For example, acceleration here um, uh, can be uh, illustrated by a gradient uh, uh, a triangle, an infinitesimal uh, gradient uh, triangle, as it is well known in school math too uh, today. And according to Leibniz's rule for infinitesimal numbers, the differential equation dv uh, equal to uh, acceleration multiplied with dt can uh, geometrically be illustrated by an infinitesimal uh, rectangle with the side length a here, the acceleration, and the infinitesimal uh, with uh, dt. And according to Leibniz, uh, the integration of the differential equation is geometrically the summation of infinite number of these uh, rectangles. Now, on this uh, background, Leibniz's conservation law of uh, kinetic energy can be derived as an integral um, principle. Potential energy with Mortua in the uh, um, uh, term of uh, uh, Leibniz is continuously transformed into kinetic energy with Viva. And that is illustrated here in uh, this um, elementary uh, experiment of the ideal pendulum. Here is a swinging uh, ball uh, in this situation with maximum potential energy and then step by step in infinitesimal step it is transformed into the maximum kinetic energy. And in the words uh, of Leibniz in Specimen Dynamicum, vis est viva ex infinitis vis mortuae impressionibus continuatis uh, nata. That means vis viva is generated through continuous accumulation of infinitesimal instances of uh, vis mortua. And that is uh, integration. Now in Specimen Dynamicum, this process is described, described in, with uh, informal uh, words, but it is easily to translate it into the uh, infinitesimal terms of the Leibnizian uh, calculus that is done here in these equations, and uh, it shows that uh, kinetic energy can be derived by integration. And it is uh, remarkable that implicitly um, um, in these uh, considerations here, uh, Leibniz himself is using uh, the uh, concept or force of uh, Newton. It is an integration of Newton's uh, force and uh, here the sphere and uh, the uh, factor uh, a half uh, comes in by uh, Leibniz uh, integration uh, rules. Now uh, for Leibniz um, the because uh, the conservation law of kinetic energy is founded by the principle of uh, sufficient reason and uh, in a closed universe potential energy is a sufficient reason of kinetic energy and vice versa. It was uh, illustrated uh, with the ideal pendulum, an expression of uh, perfect symmetry and harmony in unlimited time. For Newton, vis viva was a mystical concept. And only in V as measurable term, um, that was his argument, are assumed to be conserved. In the tradition of Eckhart, uh, following Newton, it required God to keep the universe from collapsing by friction and loss uh, energy, the famous struggle of Clark with uh, uh, Leibniz. Now the situation changed in the beginning of the 18th century. Then the experimental physicists came up to introduce experimental, experimental measure of vis viva. Uh, at first, the Italian uh, physicist uh, Polini from uh, Padua, and uh, then a little bit later on, the Dutch physicist uh, Willem um, S. Uh, Gravesant, he published the results of a series 
of uh, experiments in which brass balls were dropped from uh, varying uh, heights onto a soft clay surface that is uh, uh, illustrated uh, here. I will not go in the detail here. The point is that from now on, uh, Vis Viva was not only a theoretical concept of uh, theoretical physicists and uh, philosophers, but it was now an empirical uh, concept and uh, Emile du Châtelet realized that and uh, um, uh, propagated uh, the, the conservation law of uh, energy. Now that lead me, leads me to uh, Châtelet's concept of space and uh, time. And uh, in her Institution de Physique, she started in the tradition of the Newton-Leibniz uh, controversy on absolute and relational concepts of space and time. But uh, then uh, I think, and uh, I have the impression in the following talks that will be uh, deepened by uh, historical studies too, uh, at first she distinguishes between real space and time as physical objects in the experiments of uh, physicists and then uh, the ideal space and ideal time as geometrical and, num and uh, numerical objects of uh, philosophers and uh, mathematicians. And uh, the second point I think is here uh, by underlining the presuppositions of the ideal concepts of uh, space uh, and time as concepts of the human mind, she begins to set up what was later called the epistemic turn of uh, transcendental uh, uh, philosophy. Now uh, let us have a closer look to the empirical concept of uh, space of Du Châtelet. And uh, sh here she is on the line of Euler. And Euler, in the midst of um, the uh, 18th century, that was the uh, high level, I would say, uh, up to day interpretation of uh, Newton's uh, physics, even better than uh, Newton himself. In his Lettre à une princesse d'Allemagne, Euler distinguishes. Uh, geometrical extension in mathematics, that means the ideal elements, such as uh, it was mentioned before for uh, uh, Du Châtelet, and uh, bodies in uh, physics. And uh, in uh, his Reflexion sur l'espace de et le temps, he rigorously requests the absoluteness and reality of uh, space and time. Absolute uh, accelerations, rotation with diverting forces in the bucket experiment needs an inertial reference system. Inertial motion requires a distinction of uh, direction in space and uniform uh, motion with respect to time and therefore he concludes, Euler concludes, Leibniz fails with his purely geometrical space and cannot explain Newton's first law of motion. Now um, that was the midst of the 18th century. In the second half of uh, the uh, uh, 18th century, mechanics found its uh, final shape of today, I would say, in uh, uh, the um, uh, formulation of uh, analytical mechanics. In the historical transition from geometrical methods as presented in Newton's uh, synthetic um, uh, Principia to the methods of uh, mathematical analysis from Leibniz, Clairaut, Roux, the uh, Bernoulli's, um, D'Alembert, Laplace, Euler, Lagrange's textbook Meca uh, Mechanique Analytique from 1788-89 uh, delivers a general uh, analytical method uh, by which every um, mechanical uh, problem may be stated in a single uh, differential equation or integral uh, equation. I will not go here in these mathematical details. The point is that uh, already Du Châtelet in uh, uh, her work um, realized that there is no controversy 
between uh, Newton's and uh, Leibniz concept of um, force and uh, energy. Uh, they are interrelated, as I explained uh, before, and that is now formulated in uh, analytical mechanics in a mathematical way. So it is in that, in that sense uh, mathematically uh, justified. And there is another, uh, I think, uh, remarkable um, idea in um, uh, Duchatelet's concept of space. With a differential method of analytical mechanics, the mathematical concepts of continuous fields of uh, matter, energy and gravitation came up, um, which historically, you know, uh, dates back to um, Aristotle's concept of ether and uh, later on Leibniz's concepts of the continuum. Now for uh, Châtelet, uh, the space was not an empty space in the sense of Newton with uh, interacting uh, material uh, points, but uh, uh, the space is here in a uh, uh, quotation, une espèce de fluide et entendu à l'infini dans lequel les corps nagent. That means it is a kind of fluidum, she says, with uh, um, infinite uh, extension in which the bodies swim. And that is a nice metaphor, I think, uh, for what uh, um, perhaps later on uh, was called a field. Um, in the beginning of the 19th century, Poisson, the French uh, um, uh, physician, came up with the uh, uh, first field equation for magnetic fields. In that uh, uh, period, uh, uh, the um, mathematization of um, uh, magnetism uh, started, and in 1840, Gauss, the famous mathematician, determined the potential of a continuous gravitational field as solution of the Poisson uh, equation with field uh, density of mass, gravitational constant, and the Laplace uh, operator. And uh, this formula here is in the nucleus, at least uh, even in Einstein's uh, gravitational field theory, because it is an expression in his theory for weak uh, gravi for weak gravitational fields. So uh, Gauss field uh, equation offers a possibility to develop later on even Einstein's field equation. I think that's a remarkable historical line. We could start with uh, Du Châtelet and uh, then the mathematical uh, expression in the beginning of the 19th century for field equation and then uh, Einstein. Now Kantian concept of space and time. And here uh, I uh, started with uh, this uh, early um, uh, article of um, uh, Kant from 1768 from, from dem ersten Grunde des Unterschiedes der Gegenden uh, im Raume. And Kant argued in uh, this article that there is an absolute difference uh, of left and right uh, in nature and he related it to uh, the existence of reference systems such as the absolute space of Newton and Euler. And he explicitly uh, related to uh, Euler. I think he even sends this article to the famous Euler, but the great Euler uh, didn't uh, react. That was, of course, I think, a great uh, disappointment for the young uh, Kant. Uh, anyway, um, the uh, classic... Uh, Kant, in uh, his uh, classic period, in his critic of pure reason, claimed that before any empirical uh, measuring of space and time, schemes of space and time must be presupposed as intuitive forms a priori, uh, as uh, a priorische Anschauungsformen. And even the construction of a real ruler and a real clock must presuppose transcendental forms of space and time in human consciousness. Thus, uh, Kant underlines the subjectivity of space and time, the uh, famous Copernican uh, term. And in more detail, following Kant, sciences would be impossible if space and time were not kinds of uh, pure a priori 
in, uh, intuitions. That means uh, space and time started following Kant with, uh, intuit with forms of uh, intuition, spatial intuition and uh, temporal um, uh, intuition. And uh, uh, so it starts with synthetic terms and uh, in the prolegomena later on, it is demonstrated by him that that is the basis for at first geometry. Uh, the spatial intuition, the forms of spatial intuition are the basis for synthetic geometry in the sense of Euclid. And then with the categories of uh, human reason, the analytical formulation in analytical geometry is made uh, possible. And the same is true following Kant for uh, the uh, intuition of, uh, of time. That means uh, at first the intuitive succession of uh, points of time, now, 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 and these uh, infinite series, and that is the basis for him also an argument in the prolegomena for counting. And counting is the basis for arithmetic. So space and time, these both intuition, are the basis here for uh, mathematics. And that uh, played an uh, important role later on in the 20th century for constructive and uh, intuitionistic uh, mathematics. And these people uh, related explicitly to uh, Kant. Now. Um, uh, the uh, architecture of the critic of pure reason is well known to you. Uh, that was the transcendental aesthetic of the uh, 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 forms of uh, intuition. And uh, then transcendental uh, analytics, that means uh, the categories of uh, human reason are uh, introduced, uh, quantity, quality, relation, and uh, modality. And, um, now the question is, how can these categories as a framework of human mind be applied to, pest, to possible um, objects of uh, human experience? That means to possible physical theories. And uh, that was realized, this transition from the categories to the physical theory was realized by Kant in the metaphysical foundations of uh, natural uh, science. And uh, uh, following this line of uh, categories, he started as a motion, as basic concept of sense perceivable objects, motion as quantity. The first um, category uh, leads to phoronomy. Uh, in modern terms, uh, kinematics, uh, direction and velocity determine the relative uh, position of a body in space. Then motion as quality, the second category, leads to dynamics, attraction, uh, that is uh, gravitation and repulsion are the foundations here of space fulfillment. Gravitation is considered as long distance effect. And then the third category means relation, motion as uh, relation. Uh, that leads to mechanics in the sense of Kant. Uh, along the line of uh, the subcategories here, uh, substance uh, and uh, causality and interrelation, substance means for him the framework, the categorical framework for the conservation law um, of uh, a matter. Quantity of matter is invariant with respect to change. And then uh, the second. Uh, subcategory, causality, or change of matter has an external cause and uh, action and reaction are identical with respect to change, the third um, Newtonian uh, axiom of mechanics. There is a slight, you have observed that uh, I think now, there is a slight difference to the architecture of Newton here because uh, at the beginning there is not the lex uh, inertiae, uh, lex inertiae, um, for a force-free uh, motion is considered here uh, under uh, this uh, second category of causality concerning force-free motion, that means motion without external cause. And then uh, the last one here, uh, motion as modality in uh, phenomenology, that means with respect to modality, matter is considered as a possible possibility, a modal operator is a, is a possible object of experiment. So in modern terms, 
Kant determines the basic concepts and axioms of mechanics as a model of the epistemic categorical framework of human uh, mind. Now uh, my last part, space-time in classical and modern uh, physics. Now, uh, what is the uh, structure of classical mechanics from a modern point of view? And that means uh, since the uh, 19th century. As with Newton and Leibniz, it has been assumed um, since the 19th century that it is objectively uh, decidable if two events are simultaneous or uh, not. And therefore, these planes again, the structure of the planes can uh, be used and uh, with these uh, layers here, but unlike Newton, there is no vertical line because there is no longer the absolute space criticized as a metaphysical uh, concept. It is uh, given up and replaced now by the class of inertial movements, as these are uh, straight lines moving uniformly relative to each another. Because it turns out, in order to uh, explain the bucket experiments, we only need empirical uh, inertial, um, inertial uh, reference uh, systems and not this, not this uh, mystical uh, absolute uh, space. Uh, and in contrast to Leibniz, accelerations, because we have now inertial systems, can be distinguished from this. So the space-time of classical mechanics is in that sense more specific than the merely kinetic uh, space-time of Leibniz, um, um, because uh, we have these uh, inertial systems but uh, it is more general than the Newtonian space-time because here in this concept we miss the um, uh, existence of an uh, absolute uh, space. Inertial uh, systems are reference systems for force-free bodies moving along uh, straight lines with uniform uh, velocity. For example, here two inertial systems of a train uh, moving uh, in a railway station uniformly to uh, one uh, another and uh, in that sense uh, we cannot uh, distinguish the, uh, uh, if w w which of these uh, trains is uh, really moving and uh, so the uh, uh, local um, uh, coordinates here of space can be uh, transformed and uh, time too and uh, the expressions here were well known since uh, Galileo, th therefore they are called the Galilean uh, transformations. And uh, mechanical laws turn out to be invariant with uh, respect to uh, these transformations. And this kind of objectivity of the mechanical laws is nowadays called, therefore, the Galilean um, invariance. And Newton's hypothesis of an absolute space becomes unnecessary. It is not necessary because uh, we have already here a principle of uh, relativity. It was explicitly in that sense uh, uh, denoted by Ludwig Lange in 1885 uh, for a relativity principle for inertial systems. Uh, so we only uh, have in that sense absolute time uh, remaining in the following sense. The clock cycle is the same in all uh, these uh, inertial systems that is uh, uh, here expressed in the uh, Galilean uh, transformation. Now there was a last discussion of the absolute space in the end of the 19th uh, century at the dawn of uh, Einstein's special relativity with the Michaels and Morlo, uh, Morley uh, experiment. I will not go here in the details. Uh, the idea here is uh, to compare the speed of light in a perpendicular uh, direction in an uh, attempt to detect the relative uh, motion uh, of matter through the stationary ether here, the assumed stationary ether. I will not go here in the details. The point is that the result was negative. Uh, uh, negative uh, in that Michelson and Morley uh, found no significant uh, difference between the speed of life in the direction of the movements through the presupposed uh, uh, either the stationary space and the speed um, of light here 
at uh, right uh, angles. This uh, interferometer is uh, moved through the assumed um, uh, uh, stationary uh, space. Now, uh, that uh, was well known uh, to Einstein uh, himself, and so the step uh, to special relativity was actually very small. The ideas were in the air, I would uh, say, because there was already a um, principle of relativity in classical um, uh, mechanics. Einstein only, only in quotation mark, uh, only um, realized that we also have to consider uh, inertial systems with a very high speed near to uh, the uh, speed of light. And that means he also considered reference systems in electrodynamics. Uh, and uh, then we have to consider the constancy of speed and light. And the constancy of speed of light was no invention of Einstein, but it was already given in the Maxwell uh, equations. So that is all, the principle of uh, uh, special relativity and uh, of uh, constant velocity of light. That is special relativity, but of course you have to elaborate uh, mathematically uh, this uh, theory, especially you have to derive the uh, new uh, transformations for these new kinds of inertial systems, the uh, Lorentz uh, transformations. And what is the structure now of this space and time? You can no longer consider the planes for uh, under the assumption that uh, um, simultaneously uh, simultaneous event can uh, uh, objectively uh, decide it. But uh, instead of the planes, you have to consider now uh, the restrictions of light cones because light is uh, the limitation of speed, and this is the uh, formula of uh, the light cones here. Uh, uh, and uh, if we assume a C, the speed of uh, uh, the speed of light as uh, a unit of space of time, then we get a four-dimensional uh, space with this metric here. And here, the fourth coordinate time is uh, distinguished by the minus uh, sign, and uh, therefore. Uh, uh, this uh, so-called Minkowskian matrix of the four-dimensional Minkowskian um, space is sometimes also called a pseudo-Euclidean uh, uh, matrix. Now, uh, the step to uh, general relativity is uh, uh, very easy, in quotation mark, because uh, we remember the um, uh, field equation of uh, Gauss, and um, now, uh, again, like in special relativity, Einstein uh, is considering this field equation under a special aspect, an extreme situation, namely of very strong uh, gravitational uh, fields, for example, in the neighborhood of a uh, massive uh, star like uh, the sun. And here he presumed that uh, in this case uh, the, um, um, the uh, field is uh, deformed, is uh, a curved, which is illustrated here for a two-dimensional surface here with red lines of uh, these uh, uh, stars. And you know, in 1919, the famous um, observation of Eddington confirmed this uh, uh, prediction. Now, uh, the relation between special and general uh, relativity is obvious if we consider, again, Leibniz because Leibniz in the infinitesimal calculus, a curve consists of very small infinitesimal straight lines. And straight lines, that means Euclidean uh, geometry. And this idea was later on generalized by Gauss and uh, Riemann, uh, considering uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four- and dimensional um, spaces. So locally, you always have, uh, you always have a Euclidean, for example, Euclidean plane, Euclidean space, and uh, so on. And now it must be embedded in the gravitation theory, and you have to consider the uh, constancy of uh, light, and that leads locally not to a Euclidean metric, but to a, I said, pseudo-Euclidean metric, namely the Minkowskian 
um, space and uh, in that sense uh, special relativity is a local um, a, a theory of uh, the general uh, relativity uh, theory. Now uh, I mentioned that um, because in the end we can say that uh, uh, Einstein's general special relativity is nothing else than the correction of the classical Newtonian physics uh, with respect to extreme situations, namely extreme speed of light and, uh, ex and uh, very strong uh, gravitational forces. And I underline that because in the end that is uh, 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 under this aspect and uh, uh, still on um, on a classical deterministic theory. And that is interesting for Kantian uh, philosophy because in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the discussion came up in neo-Kantianism. Uh, is this new version of a mathematical stillery, a theory still uh, satisfying the categorical framework of Kant? And Cassira and others, they uh, agreed to that. I also would agree to that, but then here, uh, you know, in the 20th century, another theory came up, namely uh, quantum. Uh, mechanics and then the situation um, uh, must also um, uh, relate it to another uh, natural constant, namely Planck's constant. That means you are considering very small uh, systems, the quantum systems, elementary particles and so on, atoms. And uh, in this case you can no, uh, no longer uh, determine here in these uh, straight or curved lines uh, uh, determined uh, uh, directions, but uh, you have to sum up all pros pop, uh, probable uh, possibilities of passes, illustrating here Feynman's pass um, uh, integral, and uh, that leads uh, in the end to a um, different uh, uh, category of substance, I would say, namely quantum states as probability distributions. I have no time here to go in the details. In the end, the question, of course, came up if this kind of uh, um, uh, physical theory also satisfy uh, the categorical framework of Kant, and these are early books we are uh, published on uh, the quantum uh, world and uh, the classical uh, relativistic uh, world. Now, in the end, uh, what can we learn from Du Châtelet and Kant? Du Châtelet, space and time are physical reality with respect to measurement. And in modern terms, uh, to natural constants. I mentioned Planck's constant of quantum space-time, uh, velocity of light and the uh, gravitational uh, constant of relative, uh, relativistic space-time, but she also underlined that uh, these physicists need ideas of the human mind in order to uh, design these uh, physical uh, theories. And that was a point of Kant. Physical space-time theories are hypothetical models that satisfy an epistemic framework consisting of presuppositions, the categories such as substance, interaction and uh, causality. And the question is which models, physical models, are possible and testable in these frameworks. And I think there is no discussion nowadays that there are categorical frameworks, because nowadays we do not only have the Newtonian uh, models, but we have a lot. We have a variety of physical models with different uh, concepts of uh, causality and uh, of uh, what is a substance. And uh, so uh, there are different uh, categorical frameworks nowadays to characterize these kinds of uh, physical theories. But uh, the question is, of course, for a Kantian, uh, is there one unique, that was a claim of Kant, is there one unique uh, categorical uh, framework to explain uh, that? Now, uh, this is actually my last uh, uh, slide. That is um, the view of an artist uh, to uh, space-time. Here, Salvador Dali with time deletion, space-time 
uh, curvature and uh, quantum uh, space-time, but I think here no longer the uh, categories of uh, the critic of pure reason are responsible, but uh, in the terms of Kant, the judgment of state of uh, the third uh, critic of Kant, namely the uh, critic of aesthetical uh, judgment. I thank you for your attention.